Father in heaven, we invite your presence of the Holy Spirit to be with us today as we study this lesson. Help us to learn something new. Help us to relearn something we've forgotten. And help us to have something that we can help others through with this next week. Be with us now as we study. Amen. Okay. So... Our lesson this week is a few more chapters than it was last week. It's covering about nine different chapters. So we will just kind of touch on a few, um, few verses of those chapters and not every single verse in all those chapters. Um, so in the lesson this week, we discovered there are several different servants and they have several different jobs or titles or roles, however you want to look at that. Um, yes, next one, and now this one will work, yes, <laughs> yay, I love it when technology works, okay, so here's the memory verse in a different version, this is the NIV version, here's my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight, I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Would you like to see some justice in the world today? <laughs> justice is, is, yeah. It only takes a moment or two to think of some situations in the world today where we'd like to see some justice, but sometimes we have to wait. Do you think the Israelites 700 years before Christ would have thought the same? They would, not, would have wanted some justice then? How do you think they would have felt if they had known it was seven years, sorry, 700 years until Jesus came? I think sometimes it's better off to not know the future and just deal with what we're given day by day. Um, how was this justice to come about that, this is, that we're talking about here and who was going to meet it out? We will find out as we go along. So starting in Sunday, we're in Isaiah chapter 41. Now, sometimes I say Isaiah, and sometimes I say Isaiah. I'll probably mix them all up. I've lived half my life in the U.S. and about half my life in Australia. <laughs> so I get quite mixed up. But anyway, whichever one I say, it's the same person. Um, so, reading in Isaiah 41, 8 and 9. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. So who is the servant in these verses here? Is it a single person? Is it a whole group of people? Yep. Yeah. I think this one's a whole big group of people. It says on the third line, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. So Abraham had heaps of descendants. We're talking about a whole nation here. It's not just one particular servant. And I'm used to touch screens as well. This is terrible. There we go. <laughs> um, we can also look at these people, this nation, in another part of the Bible in Exodus. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. This is another time that God was talking about the Israelites as a group. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then, reach, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So this is a group of people. It's the Israelites. It's the nation of Israel. What was the job of the Israelites? Did they have a role? Uh, brief, a, something they were supposed to do? They were to evangelize the world. Anything else? To be a shining light. To, be a shining light. to obey the voice of God. What about just trusting in God? They were tasked with just trusting as well. Um, Back to the previous slide. Um, oh, no, not that one. This one. Um, 
you're my servant, you have, I have chosen you and I've not rejected you. They're just supposed to trust and obey, basically, is what they were supposed to do. Isaiah 41.10, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you in my righteous right hand. That's a wonderful promise there. So they're just supposed to be helped by God, not to be running the other way away from God. But what did they do? That's exactly what they did. They ran to other idols. They ran to other gods. Do we do the same thing? Do we try to do things on our own? We all fail. <laughs> Yes, we do. We absolutely do. I think it's because we can see what's in the here and now. Like the people back then, they could see the idols, they could see the altars, they could whatever, see it, but we can't really see God. And I think sometimes if you can't see, out of sight, out of mind. So it's a job to remember there's a whole big unseen world out there. Oops, I haven't caught you up with where I'm at. There we are, Isaiah 41.10. Um, let's see. Can you think of some examples of people in the Old Testament that did have faith and they did follow God? It wasn't everyone that lost their way, that lost their brief. Think of some people in the Old Testament that were followers, that did listen, that did try. Elijah, Moses. Sorry? Daniel, yep. And the three young men. Yep, the three, the three young men in the fire, yep. And the thousands True, yes, there were thousands. Remember, it was Elijah or Elisha. He thought he was the only person left that believed in God, that had the faith. But there was really thousands of others. He just didn't know about them. But God knows about all of them, yeah. I thought of Joshua and Gideon. You know, the faith that they had to march around Jericho, I mean, all they did was march and blow the trumpet. How on earth could anything, how on earth could they have conquered a city that way? But it wasn't up to them. It was up to God. And Gideon, just the 300 men with their torches under the pitchers, and they break them, and then in the confusion, God took that whole army. They didn't have to fight at all. We just have to remember to revisit these examples and... By, re by visiting these examples, we will help us remember that we aren't on our own. Even though we may not be fighting flesh and blood armies that we can see, there are armies out there that we need to be strong against, and we can't do it on our own. Um, if I was writing the lesson, I would have picked this verse here as the um, memory verse, I think. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I don't think it's just a promise for back then. I think it's a promise for us now as well. And moving along, further down in Isaiah 41, verse 14. Do not be afraid, you worm Jacob. Little Israel, do not fear. For I myself will help you, declares the Lord. What point do you think God is making here? What point do you think? Mm -hmm. No matter how much you feel you are on your own, he's with us, yep. Think of that word worm. What picture does that bring in your mind? <laughs> right. No, it doesn't. The worm has a small view, yes. God was making a point that uh, the worm needed a bigger view, a bigger mm. picture. Yeah. And that God hadn't rejected him or hadn't discarded him. Mm. Yeah. Any other connotations that worms brings up? Yes? Yeah. Um, the worm is helpless but not useless. True. Yep. They're very useful in my compost bin. <laughs> uh, 
And Jacob was running away from his home where he was born, grew up, and he was going to the future that he didn't have a clue. Mm. But God visited him and he said, listen, I'm with you. Mm. Hang on. Yep. Keep close. Thanks. Yep, exactly. Worms aren't terribly attractive, but they are very, very useful. And, I mean, they don't have legs. They don't have a brain, really. And, yeah, I don't really like being compared to a worm, but maybe <laughs> we are sometimes. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big gardener, and yeah. I love worms. I'm always buying worm farms and spreading yeah. them out all across the retirement village I live in yeah. and trying to make everything grow better. I think worms are fantastic. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, moving on now to the Monday's lesson. Um, Isaiah 42 verses 1 through 7. So we've talked about Israel as a nation and they're a servant and they're supposed to be trusting in God and being an example for other nations to look at. Here in Isaiah 42, we have a different servant. Let's read about this servant. Here is my servant whom I, am, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice, that magical justice word again. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what the Lord God, this is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. Go down. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people, a light to the, for the Gentiles. To open eyes that are blind to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Do these verses sound like a repeat of any other verses we've already read in Isaiah? It would have been many lessons ago. Yes. They're actually a very interesting collection of words, those. Um, because they are an extension of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, which is quoted in Luke 4 by Jesus. Uh, he reads it, actually, in the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Um, and he, we say often, oh, well, you know, Jesus quoted Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, full stop. But Jesus actually also incorporated those very words you've just read about opening the eyes of the blind and, yeah. and so on, um, which isn't in Isaiah 61, but is in Isaiah 41. So Jesus put the two together in order to formulate his mission and to present it uh, to the world. And also uh, when he, uh, when he um, stated it there in the uh, synagogue in Nazareth. Yep. Thank you very much, Carol. So can we conclude that this unnamed servant in Isaiah 42 is the same, is, is a singular person, and this one single person in these verses we've just read is the Messiah? This is a prophecy that the people back in ancient times would have understood. They would have understood the references to, well, um, back in, I, let's look at Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. If you want to open up, I didn't put this one on the screen. Thank you, wait, computer. Isaiah 9, so Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So 
they would have been able to join these verses, these chapters up together, these prophecies together, and know that this one single person here was the Messiah person who's being talked about in different places. This isn't a nation that's going to do these different prophecies here, the um, releasing the people from the captives from prison and opening the eyes of the blind. It's the one person. It's the Messiah. Next one. Oh, yes. And here is um, in Matthew 12, 15 to 21. These verses are after a time when Jesus was talking about doing miracles on the Sabbath. And this is a time when he quoted um, Isaiah. Aware of this, Jesus went, withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, till he has brought justice through to victory. His name, in his name, the nations will put their hope. So again, we don't have to guess who this servant was. Servant Messiah quotes those verses back in Isaiah, and there he is fulfilling them. Think of the way that Jesus ministered. Oops, I didn't move them all along for you. There. Um, no one will hear his voice in the streets. He won't quarrel or cry out. He, back up another one. He healed those who were ill. He warned others not to tell. He warned them not to tell others about him. How many times did Jesus say, you know, just, just be quiet about this. I need to keep going about my way. Sometimes he told them to go back and tell, you know, villages. I can think of the time where the demoniac, when the pigs jumped off the hill and he was told to go tell his, his village, his people, his town, about Jesus and what happened, but there was other times where he was just like, just keep it quiet. <laughs> so he wasn't out there to blow his own trumpet. He was there to help others. Yes. Thanks, Pam. Just a little note to add to what you're saying, which is uh -huh. very good. Um, you noted that um, Jesus told the demoniac um, to go and spread abroad what had been done for him. The demoniac was from Gadara, that's Gentile country. The closer you get to Jerusalem, the quieter Jesus wanted things kept about what That's he did. That's true. Yeah. He didn't want to exacerbate his death before mm. the time was right. Mm -hmm. And so he was careful about how much was said and how much he allowed people to say yeah. about his great and mighty works. Thank you. It's nice to have scholars in the audience helping us out. <laughs> All right. Let's go down to... Oops, let's get on the same page. Um, I want to go back. This one, what does it say? Bruce, <laughs> I can barely see the screen without glasses. Um, all right, so what lessons can we learn from the way Jesus lived his life and how he taught? What lessons can we learn from the, what we've just read in these verses here? Matthew. Whoops, by the way. I see we shouldn't be quarreling. We should be, uh, how he talks about the um, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. We shouldn't be putting people down. We should be building people up. That's how I see it. If you see somebody doing, the, somebody doing something that they shouldn't be doing, something wrong, something that you can see would be leading them down a path not towards God, you don't hit them over the head with a stick and, you know, just bring it down on them. You encourage them. You, you encourage them and you, you point out what they're doing that's not good for them, but you don't beat them over the head with a 
with it. I wouldn't like to be, I wouldn't be very receptive <laughs> to, to being told what to do in that way. Now we're on to Tuesday. This one here, this title of the lesson on Tuesday is the Persian Messiah. I don't ever recall hearing about this phrase until the lesson this week. So this was a very interesting section to me, this, this Tuesday section. Um, so this, what we're taking up here, it's God is talking. This is Isaiah 44, verses 24, to chapter 45, verse 6. I am the Lord. Yep, you're on the same page. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and who turns it into nonsense, and who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited, and their ruins, I will restore them. Who says to the watery deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and will, con will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. Now this verse here in the middle, Yep, you've got the same thing I've got. Um, who says of Cyrus? He actually names this person in the future. Cyrus is actually named. That doesn't, has that ever happened before? That in a prophecy, an actual person that the prophecy is about is named? There is actually one other place in the Bible where a specific prophecy about a specific king and the king is named. It's in 1 Kings 13, verse 2. And it's King Josiah. I'll just whip over there very quickly. 1 Kings 13. 13, and verse 2. By the word of the Lord, he cried out against the altar. Altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you, he will sacrifice the priests of the high places who made offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. So there is another time where like a king that was going to be a fulfillment of prophecy was named, and it was 300 years after that prophecy that Josiah came. So this is only the second time. So Cyrus is actually named. Let's continue on down here and over there. This is, the, this is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus. Whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you, and I will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you, will, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name for the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my, my chosen. I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor Though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from the, me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. That's pretty amazing. And this is a Persian king. This isn't an Israelite. Here God is making him a partner. Yes, comment. I'm just wondering, um, at the time when Cyrus lived, he was the one that let God's people go back after the, the captivity yep. in Babylon. I'm wondering whether perhaps Daniel actually showed Cyrus the prophecy and explained that you were going to come to do this. Yeah. There's actually, um, in Prophets and Kings... 
There is a bit about Daniel on page 557. I'll just read that now. Um, the deliverance of Daniel from the den of lions had been used of God to create a favorable impression upon the mind of Cyrus the Great. The sterling qualities of the man of God as a statesman of far-seeing ability led, to the, led the Persian ruler to show him marked respect and to honor his judgment. And now, just at that time, God had said he would cause his temple at Jerusalem to be rebuilt. He moved upon Cyrus as his agent to discern the prophecies concerning himself, which with David was so familiar, and to grant the Jewish people their, li their liberty. As the king saw the words foretelling more than 100 years before his birth, it was about 150 years from the time Isaiah said this to the time when Cyrus became king, um, the manner in which Babylon should be taken, as he read the message addressed to him by the ruler of the universe, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. As he saw before his eyes the declaration of the eternal God, for Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. As he traced the inspired record, I have raised him up in righteousness. I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall go to my captives, for not, for the, not for price nor reward. His heart was profoundly moved, and he was determined to fulfill the divinely appointed mission. So he did realize it. He did realize that he was part of God's big plan in, um, in, in history. Yeah. I wonder if that would make him puffed up or if, or if it would make him humble. I think God makes pretty clear here. Um, oh dear, what page are you on? Back, back, back. There we are. It starts out, I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of, of false prophets and makes fools of diviners. I think God makes pretty clear that he's bigger than any other possible God. He's way bigger than any idol that can be toppled. He is everything. He's everywhere. He's the everything God everywhere. <laughs> There's no other way to really say it. Um, let's see. I think we've covered Tuesday. Well, no, we haven't. Let's get down to... That's all of the Isaiah words. Um, this is hard to do two screens at once. Might be trying to do too much. Here we go. Down. Oops, up. All right. Now, there is a time when Cyrus did call on God. Let's, I didn't put the verses on the screen for this one, so we'll have to look them up. Open your Bible to Isaiah 41.25. Forty-one. Where is that? Forty-one twenty-five. I keep getting Isaiah twenty-five. Isaiah forty-one. If somebody else has it, they can read it. <laughs> Ah, there in the middle, Cheryl has it. Ta. I have stirred up one from the north, and he comes, one from the rising sun who calls on my name. He treads on rulers as if they were mortar, as if he were a potter treading the clay. So here it says the person from the north 
he calls on his on my name on god's name so there it is predicting is telling that cyrus will call on god's name and if we go to ezra 1 back after chronicles and kings ezra chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 in the first year of cyrus king of persia in order to fulfill the word of the lord spoken by jeremiah the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation through his realm and also put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. So he did do what God told him to do. He, um, he acknowledged that God had given him the kingdoms of the earth, and his kingdom was absolutely massive. I'm not good at geography. And, um, yeah, other people, <laughs> namely... There we are. Um, this is Russell's cousin, Dr. Lloyd Willis. He has a Bible study about the lessons as well, and I had a squeeze at this through the week. And if you want to have a read of this, he, he um, has facts and artifacts that I don't have time to show here or share. And I think these are the um, archaeological finds that, we've been, that they've been finding in the recent times. It really adds credibility to the Bible for me. Does archaeology strengthen your faith at all? When you find something that you hear only in the Bible and it's corroborated by a second source, it really strengthens my faith. And I think it is a... Do we have an advantage to be living now that we have all this evidence? Or do you think it's harder for us now? Do we have more of a burden, more of a... I don't know what the word is... Um, more of a yeah there's lots of distractions for us I yeah think we we live in a more skeptical world mm. that um, helps it, it kind of affects us in some ways but i think it's we are at an advantage because more and more things do confirm in a very real practical way mm. the bible story is true yeah was there another comment back there all good? Yep. So I encourage you on this daggy afternoon to have a um, look at his um, video that he's made there. It, it, it was very, very interesting to read. And next we have Wednesday's lesson. I'll get zipping through now, <laughs> through this now. Um, this one brings back a bit what Russell was talking about last week, about is there two different Isaiahs? The fact that Isaiah actually predicted Cyrus by name disturbs some people who do not believe that prophets receive predictions from God, and to cope, they accept the theory that of a second Isaiah, a prophet who was actually living in the time of Cyrus. So it's, it wouldn't have been a prophet predicting anything. He would have just been reporting on these things that Cyrus had done. But um, the time of Cyrus was the time of Daniel, which was 150 years after Isaiah. And there were several... Oh, here we go. This is one of Russell's slides from last week, but he's added in... See in the bottom, there's the red words Isaiah, his years. There's and that first oval, ovally circle. That's the time when he wrote those first one to thirty-nine chapters. The first is sorry, chapters one to thirty-nine was about that captivity section just there, and the later half, well, not really half, but the, but chapters forty-six to sorry, chapters forty to sixty-six were about what was going to happen later on in this Persian time. And Cyrus there starts at 539. So that's where he falls in with Isaiah's thing. And, and last week Russell also spoke about um, 
basically proof that this isn't two different Isaiahs, it's, it's one person. Yes. Yeah, apparently in the, um, the scroll of, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that the, of the scroll of Isaiah, the, the, um, the sections between the end of verse, uh, chapter 39 mm -hmm. and the beginning of chapter 40 is in the middle of a page. Yes. And, yes. and there's no break, there's mm. no, no disconnection, it just goes yeah. on. Yeah. A and um, it, it, it's, um, you know, they obviously didn't at that time understand two different Isaiahs. Yeah. Um, and some people even say there's three Isaiahs, but we won't go into that. <laughs> but the, the, That's too um, the, 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 the thing is, when people are writing, they write different ways to different people. Someone writing to their wife would write much differently to they write to their bank manager. Right? <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> right? So, so, you know, different styles uh, and, um, and, and different subjects um, would, ha would, would sound different, mm. but they're still written by the same person. Exactly. Yep. And this just is another slide from Russell's last week. These different ways, these are different arguments for the one Isaiah, but the two that stand out most for me, that seal the deal for me the most, would be those Dead Sea Scrolls, how it doesn't. It's not two separate pages. It's not like it was joined together. It was, there's no break between chapters 39 and 40. And the other one, the one that I remembered and had to ring Russell to find the exact words for, Isaiah's title for God, his favorite way of referring to God is Holy One of Israel. And he used it 12 times in the first part of his book and 14 times in the last part of his book. And, the, and then the whole rest of the Old Testament, that's only used six times. So that's rather unique to Isaiah. It's his phrase, his way of, of describing his title for God. Um, so that's another one that's makes me think it was just, it, he, Isaiah was really a prophet. He was predicting the future, and it wasn't the second person just describing the facts as they were happening. And there's also 19 times from the book of Isaiah that it was quoted in the New Testament. And on Thursday, we're on to another servant. But this servant is the same one. This is the Messiah again. And to get things done and reasonably close to on time, we'll just read a couple of the verses. Um, Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 12. And I think this is just verse 4 here. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hands, and my reward is with my God. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see you stand up. Princes will see you and bow down. Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel has chosen you. Going back up to the first part of that but I said this is Jesus talking but I said I I have labored in vain I have spent my strength for nothing at all yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand I think we need to look at that do you ever feel like you're toiling in vain you're studying with someone and then they seem to reject the message that you're trying to bring them point them to to God a family member that you're trying to show the love of Christ, and they just don't see it. Jesus had those same feelings. Have I labored in vain? That's how he felt. But he didn't, and we won't either. Um, yep, yeah, the bottom of Thursday's lesson, the question's at the bottom. Look back at Christ's ministry <clears throat> right, up, right up until the end. Didn't he have reasons for discouragement, yet he stayed faithful despite outward appearances? How are we to do the same despite outward appearances? How are we supposed to do the same? 
What, do we, what are we supposed to do when we get discouraged? Perhaps remember our sermon this morning. Remember, yeah. put things in significance, in its right place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely. Yep. And let's see. You also need to remember that worm. Get the bigger picture. The worm? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Get the bigger picture. <laughs> yeah. The bigger picture is very important. And let's see. Done with that one. Let's go to the next. Whoops. Too far. There we are. We've now zoomed to Friday's section. Um, this is just the quote on the, the Friday section, but I thought it was really important to read. Um, I won't paraphrase it, I'll actually read it. In the work of soul winning, great tact and wisdom are needed. The Savior never suppressed the truth, but he uttered it always in love. In his dealings with others, he exercised the greatest tact. He was always kind and thoughtful. He was never rude never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave unnecessary pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. I'd like to see a human being do that <laughs> that's not Jesus. That's just so hard. Um, he never made truth cruel. He never manifested, he, but he ever manifested a deep tenderness for humanity. Every soul was precious in his sight. He bore himself with divine dignity, yet he bowed with the tenderest compassion and regard to every member of the family of God. He saw in all souls whom it was his mission to save. I think that is a huge challenge, a huge challenge. Do you see our church reflecting these principles? I think sometimes we do a good job and sometimes we might come down a bit hard. It's hard to know which way to go, but even there in the middle it said he fearlessly denounced hypocrisy unbelief and iniquity you can think of the time where jesus threw the tax the the sellers out of the um the, te the temple when they were selling and he knocked over those tables so he does get angry but his voice as he uttered the scathing rebukes he never made truth cruel but he ever manifested tenderness he did it with tears in his voice. I just hope I'm not, don't need to be on the end of, end of um, his training too often. <laughs> but we all are. We all fail. But the wonderful, wonderful promise is he's always there for us. He always forgives us just if we ask. Does anybody else have any comments they'd like to make before we close about this lesson? I guess I'll just wrap up with prayer then. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the prophecies that you've given us in the Old Testament that, that, that foretold Jesus coming. Thank you for the example that he gave for us. We try to live up to his example and we fail all the time. Please continue forgiving us. Please help us to always ask for forgiveness and not get discouraged when we act like a worm sometimes, not seeing the big picture. Thank you for understanding and hearing our prayers. Please go with us this week and help us to reach others and help us to have that, that kind and compassionate voice that you'd have us to have to show people the way to salvation through you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.